for many months now, we've periodically been holding events at the Washington Institute on uh, the situation in Syria. Um, they've uh, often been based on first-hand impressions from um, our scholars who have traveled to the borders of Syria, uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, to uh, investigate the situation on the ground, um, uh, to, to meet with um, uh, refugees, leaders of the opposition, leaders of key countries um, uh, in the in the um, uh, in the region, and to report back their findings and to offer recommendations as next steps forward. Um, I think it's fair to say there's been a consistent drumbeat from this podium and from uh, this organization about the urgency of greater involvement, um, of greater engagement uh, 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 early on. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes it's uh, those messages have made their way to the powers that be, and sometimes they haven't. Um, I think the, um, the reason why we're holding today's event under the title is the end near in Damascus is because um, our scholars believe we're hitting an inflection point. Um, of course, the question is the end near in Damascus depends on how one defines end as you will hear from our scholars. Um, if end is defined as uh, breaking of the Assad regime, then um, perhaps you have one answer. If end is defined as uh, uh, the cessation of hostilities and the return to a peaceful, unitary Syria with an accepted leadership and a reasonably well-functioning government mm -hmm. under a, you know, an accepted, uh, um, a repre representative um, government, you might get a very different um, answer to is the end near in Damascus. Uh, to address these questions uh, and how we're going to reach whichever end may in fact be near, I'm uh, very proud to be able to introduce a uh, team really that have been traveling back and forth for some time now and that come today to offer their impressions on the current situation on military, political, humanitarian level um, uh, from their travels and from their expertise. Uh, first we'll hear from Jeff White. Uh, Jeff, as uh, followers of the Institute know, Jeff is um, uh, a former um, uh, senior official of the Defense Intelligence Agency, 35 years in uh, defense intelligence, um, who uh, comes to the Institute with that background, that experience, which he has brought to his very detailed assessment of what's going on on the ground in the military confrontation inside Syria. And we'll hear first from Jeff. Uh, then we'll hear from Andrew. Um, uh, Andrew's a senior fellow here at the Institute. Um, more than eight years experience living in Syria. Um, authored a book based on his experience. Um, and um, brings to today um, uh, special insights from his recent travels, along with Jeff, to the borders of Syria. Um, uh, you may have seen some of Andrew's pictures, uh, which uh, made their way into, the, into yesterday's New York Times Times cast on uh, the situation in Syria. Uh, and he'll be speaking on the politics and the humanitarian aspects and next steps um, in, the, um, in the emerging um, uh, political evolution of the opposition and the relationship between the opposition and perhaps foreign powers getting more deeply engaged in the situation. So first Jeff, then Andrew, then your questions. Jeff? Thank you, Rob. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming to, uh, to our program. I hope you find it uh, interesting, if not necessarily enjoyable. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to talk about the, the military situation. Uh, ba basically, I'm, I'll look at the you know, sort of how the regime has got to the point it's at, uh, what the end game, I think, the or end game possibilities are, are for the regime, and how we might see you know, the indicators. We'll see that the uh, regime is going to fall or is about to fall. Uh, in fact, you know, for, first the uh, you know, I think it should be obvious to everybody that the regime's military position is becoming increasingly precarious. Uh, basically throughout the, the country, but especially in the north, now significantly in the east, even today, Hama uh, looks worse than it has for months. And the situation in the Damascus area and Damascus city itself 
is significantly uh, deteriorating for the regime. So the regime is, uh, I think, in a, in a pretty significant uh, difficulties from a military standpoint. Uh, important tr trends in the war are running against the regime forces. Uh, the regime's offensive capabilities are waning. In fact, you could say they've waned effectively. Uh, it's having difficulty holding on to positions that are once held, you know, easily or, or quite readily. Uh, the use of air power, the use of uh, our, the field artillery, which is actually much more of a, fa of a factor than air power in the war, and most recently the use of SCUDs, all of those efforts by the regime to slow, stop, or roll back the opposition forces are failing. They're not basically affecting the downward direction of the military situation from, from the regime's uh, point of view. Uh, in my mind, uh, the likely prospects are for the regime's position to deteriorate you know, further, uh, perhaps dramatically, uh, in, in the weeks ahead. Um, unless there's some major change uh, by the regime in its approach to the war. Uh, that could be uh, large-scale intervention by Hezbollah forces, uh, Iranian intervention in some, some way, although it's sometimes hard to see how that could happen, or maybe the use of uh, chemical weapons. Those are ways the regime could change the, or potentially, or hopefully from its standpoint, uh, change the direction of the battle. But again, in, in, my, in my mind, the regime's forces could collapse at any time now. You know, I think it's, you know, maybe the war's got some weeks to run, maybe even a few months, but not more than that, I don't believe. And they could, the, we could see a major collapse of the regime's forces any time uh, at, at this point. And, and if you look at the regime's forces, you just see them on, you know, YouTube and, and, and look at the, the kinds of actions and battles and, and so on that they're fi fighting they're starting to look like a defeated army. Now, we have a report today out of the Aleppo province that regime forces in the Safira area, which is a chemical weapons area, uh, retreated in the uh, face of uh, opposition forces and burned their artillery weapons, right, to avoid them being captured. That's not a good sign for any army when you're burning your artillery, right? So the simple answer to the question posed, if we're talking about the regime, is the, regime, the, the end is near, right? And so people who are thinking about policy and, and how to deal with the situation in Syria, they should be thinking about near term, quite near term, end for the regime. Okay, so what are the trends that are uh, making that so, uh, in, in my mind? Uh, there's two kinds of trends, I think, in, in you know, we can talk about uh, first of these is trends in the forces, the two forces involved, regime forces and the, uh, the rebel forces. The first, the, talk about the rebels first, you know, what we see there overall is improving combat capabilities of rebel units. Rebels are getting better. Uh, they've gotten better, maybe not steadily, but significantly since the winter of uh, 2012. Um, what's the evidence of this? Um, we see them reducing the regime's presence just about everywhere in the country where the war is being fought. That's the, re the reduction of checkpoints, the taking of regime installations, police stations, intelligence posts. It's not something you hear a lot about, but every day regime <coughs> checkpoints, barriers, whatever, are falling to rebel forces. They're taking them. This is eroding the regime's capabilities both to fight the battle and to control the, uh, the, po the population. Uh, it also provides the rebels with arms and ammunition. It provides them with experience in fighting. And it, co it contributes, I think, to the psychological domination the rebels are beginning, I think, to exert over uh, regime forces. These little battles all the time. There's also a lot of big battles, too. But these little ones, I think, are important. Uh, the rebels are interdicting uh, and controlling lines of communication in Idlib province, in Aleppo province, and in Raqqa province. Right? The regime has difficulty moving forces in those areas. Uh, the rebels are isolating and harassing uh, other regime positions and airfields all the time. They, have, you know, they now have the capability to attack some of these places with indirect fire weapons. And we see this in Aleppo, Idlib, and Dar uh, province where they may not be able to take an installation or airfield and, you know, in main combat, but they can bombard it and harass it. 
Uh, we now see, and I think this is significant and a fairly new development, is they're actually defeating regime units, okay? Not just treating them. Uh, they defeated the 46th Regiment in Aleppo, in Aleppo province, the 111th Regiment in Aleppo province, and it looks like the 34th Brigade in Dara, or at least did significant damage to the 34th Brigade in Dara, south of Damascus. It looks like I mentioned today that they've had some kind of success, you know, significant success in, in the Safira area against regime forces there. Uh, a, a very important development, I think, is the, the rebels are now, have a self-sustaining capability, right? They're not dependent on foreign assistance, right? And there is, in fact, I think, a declining need for external assistance to, the, to these guys. They're seizing weapons and ammunition from regime positions. This includes SAMs, shoulder-fired SAMs and anti-tank weapons. Uh, saw, I saw a picture the other day, a journalist <coughs> sent me of a uh, <coughs> rebel soldier in Aleppo with an RPG-29, uh, which they acquired during the uh, re recent fighting era where they seized a couple, a couple of installations. They appear to be able to recruit and replace personnel. Uh, they, they, they are taking losses. Uh, but they seem to be able to fill those. Uh, what we see now is sus sustained and coordinated operations by rebel units. You used to see this once in a while, especially the coordination, but now it's almost routine where you have multiple formations involved in actions against the uh, regime, and they conduct sustained actions, long-term siege of positions, uh, long-term uh, you know, fights with, uh, with re regime units. Um, this is, um, you know, become key, I think, to their ability to take some of these regime positions that held out for months against them. They, they're both, they, can, they can both sustain the fight and they can coordinate a, a large-scale uh, large fight. We also see that they're still forming units. You still see the, you know, units appearing on YouTube and, and joining in battle, at least, you know, presumably some of them do. There are some just you know, what we call YouTube units, but they're all, when we see that there are other ones that are real, I think. Uh, another uh, key development, I, I think, for the rebels is the, uh, they've developed or created, achieved whatever, some very combat capable formations. P units, elements that actually know how to fight pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, in, in some uh, sense, these appear to be largely Islamist units, right? the ones we see anyway. Uh, these provide the uh, rebel forces with an, a combat edge, right? People who are quite willing to fight, close with the enemy, uh, get killed in the process, but defeat regime forces and, and cause significant attrition on regime forces. And these guys have become, the, in my mind, the vanguard of the armed opposition. Right? They are, they are leading the battle, I think, against, the, against regime forces. Okay, the second uh, major force trend, and related to the first one, is uh, declining regime capabilities, right? Well, well you know, you have two um, you know, axes here, right? One is, there are two vectors here. One is the, the upward vector of the, um, of the rebel forces, and the other is the downward vector direction of, of, of the regime uh, forces. And so for evidence of this, uh, you know, what I see is uh, you see no large maneuvers or operations anymore by regime forces. Last large scale operation by regime forces was in Aleppo in the summer when they tried to retake the city and failed. That was the last major multi-brigade level you know, operation about 10,000 people or more were involved in that. That was the last one of those. What you now see is mostly small um, level, small or lower level uh, operations, actions uh, by uh, regime forces. I would be hard pressed to say or to find or point to a single brigade sized action, coordinated brigade sized action by, by the regime. I'm not saying they're not, they don't happen. But I just don't see you know evidence of happening. And I, I look fairly, uh, fairly closely. Operations seen actions by the regime forces seem to be battalion level or below in most cases. You know, fairly fairly small actions. Uh, a lot of local fights, not you know big fights, local fights. Uh, you know, by the regime forces. 
I also think there's a evidence of a declining offensive spirit by the by regime forces. And this is a you know a hugely important thing for the regime. You now many many efforts, uh, attacks, um, actions by the regime are reportedly turned back uh, by the rebels. They've been trying for weeks to clear Daraya, a uh, suburb south of uh, Damascus, and have not been able to do it. There have been repeated attacks by regime forces in there, and they fail and turn back. And this happens in a, in a lot of places. Once in a while, they, they succeed, but generally. The, they do not have the, it looks like, you know, the will to really prosecute the, uh, these fights. Um, in, in parallel to that is declining defensive capabilities. This is a more, this is a more recent development. But we're seeing them lose positions they held for a long time. The uh, fire base and air base at Abu Kamal was lost. The artillery fire base at May Mayadeen was lost. The, uh, the 46th Regiment base was lost and, and so on. These are places that they held for months uh, under rebel pressure, and then, and then the uh, defenses there uh, collapsed. And then the third major um, evidence of the decline of uh, regime capabilities is the attrition of regime tr forces, right? By my count, the regime is losing about 1,000 men per month killed, okay? Okay, you can, you know, you can use a standard military, you know, factor of, you know, four wounded for every one killed. So that's about 5,000 casualties per month for the last five or six months. You know, so that's 25, 30,000 casualties, right? Probably two or three times that for the overall for the war for, you know, for 21 months, just as a, you know, kind of off the top of your head figure. Those are, those are substantial casualties. So they're losing people. The, um, the rebels, you know, by contrast, they're losing about 850 men per month k killed in action for the last five or six months. Uh, but they seem to be able to replace those guys. Now, rebel losses recently are increasing. In fact, for the first time, we're actually seeing more rebels being killed per day than, than uh, regime forces. So you know, there's something going on there. And also, but important also for the, um, uh, for the rebels is they're, they're losing a lot of unit commanders are being killed in combat. And that's, you know, because of the nature of the, of the close in fighting. Now, you know, for, uh, there's some, those are force trends, right? There are some operational trends, I think, as well, uh, you know, underway. Uh, one, we see an increasing number of clashes. You know, basically since April, cl clashes, you know, engagements between the forces have gone up every month, right? And this puts, you know, a lot of strain uh, on the regime. Uh, we also see continuous pressure, you know, in just about everywhere the, you know, the war is going on. The war is now being fought in 12 of 14 provinces, right? So that, you know, for the regime, that's bad news, right? There's only two provinces that aren't very much affected. One is Tartus and the other one is Soweto. So there's not a lot going on there. And just in the past few days, since Sunday, in fact, we see a lot of uh, significant increase in fighting in Hama uh, province, both in the city and, and in the countryside itself. And the last major, uh, you know, trend I, I think, I think uh, is underway is we see the rebels closing the operational gaps that the regime enjoyed, or operational advantage, advantages that the regime enjoyed at the beginning of the war. The regime initially had a significant advantage in terms of armor and mechanized infantry. That, that gap has been closed. <coughs> that, they don't really enjoy any significant advantage from, from that anymore. The, the regime used to be able to move forces easily around the country, whereas the rebels just had to fight locally. That gap has been closed. The regime cannot move like it used to, and the rebels now have a degree of operational uh, mobility that they didn't have before. The air versus ground gap, uh, where the regime dominated, had complete control of the air and can do what it wanted to, that is beginning to narrow. Rebel anti-aircraft capabilities are significantly improving. The last gap, which is the regime's advantage in artillery, uh, that has not closed. That's still pretty significant, but the rebels are gaining some uh, increased indirect fire capability. Now, f uh, for end games, uh, military end games, I think there's five, you know, five kind of scenarios to you know think about. One is provincial dismantlement. Right? That is, you know, province by province. The, the regime's uh, control falls, and, the, and these provinces fall, fall to the uh, rebels. 
that's already underway, I think. The, re the regime masks this, in a sense, by, by always, or trying to always maintain a presence in every province. It doesn't abandon any province com completely yet. A second scenario is the uh, chaotic collapse of forces, right? This is like in Germany in 1918, when after a long fight, you know, the army, sim the army simply broke and the po political situation changed dramatically. I think the situation is trending in that, in that direction. A third scenario, scenario is con control contraction. Uh, and, and I define this as a, a calculated regi regime decision to fall back to Damascus and or, and or the coast and a controlled execution of that decision. We don't see any sign of that yet. And, and I think this scenario of controlled contraction is unlikely. I, be I believe the regime lacks the capacity to either you know, develop that decision or to actually uh, execute it if have to. The fourth uh, outcome is a, just a rush for the coast. You know, that is the, the regime and its forces try and get to the coast. Uh, we don't see any sign of that yet. And the fifth and least likely uh, scenario is that the regime actually recovers, makes a you know come back, and uh, you know sort of reverses the course of the war. We don't see any uh, any indication of that at all. It does not look like it has the uh, capacity uh, to do that. <coughs> So how long has the regime got? Uh, in my view, at best, a few months, more likely some weeks, you know, a few weeks. Um, and as I said, a, a serious collapse, uh, you know, could, could occur uh, basically at any point in time. Uh, what are we going to see, I think, in, in the weeks ahead? I think we'll see further rebel advances, and we'll see loss of additional uh, regime positions in the provinces. The rebels are already, even, you know, even today, in a sense, threatening the uh, major regime airfields in, in Aleppo and, and Dar and Dar al Zor. They could fall. Um, not too too distant future here. Uh, we're not going to see the regime be able to do, you know, m any significant counterattacks. I think we're going to see increased fighting in Damascus proper. We'll see more defections of regime forces. There've been some fairly substantial defections re uh, recently. We might see an occasional regime uh, success here and there. But basically, it's a downward direction uh, you know, for, the regime, uh, uh, it's for the regime in the weeks ahead. Okay, signs that the, war, the end is near, I think. Um, these are what I think we might see. Uh, we might see uh, some desperate pleas by the regime's allies for, to get a ceasefire, right? You know, sort of before a massacre occur, occurs. Iranians, Russians, Chinese, whomever. We might see another UN effort to broker a ceasefire as the rebels close in around Damascus and, and the regime's last days are evident. Could see evacuation of Russian citizens. Uh, we may see the abandonment of the regime by its allies. You know, the Russians, they have a lot of experience with losing allies and seeing regimes that they back fall, so they might be pretty good at, uh, in judging once when, it's going to happen. Uh, we could see, uh, you know, senior defections, maybe even suicides by uh, regime leaders, the flight of regime leaders either internally uh, or, you know, to the coast for the Alawites or externally. Uh, we could, and I think we will see the disintegration of regime forces. You know, that means defection of regime units uh, to the rebel side, ref refusal by regime units to obey orders, the melting away of units, guys just simply you know, going, going off, maybe some units going rogue, um, which could be a pretty dangerous situation. And we might see some move by the military against the, regi against the regime itself. This is, you know, the July 1944 scenario, uh, a desperate attempt to av you know, avoid the consequences. Uh, we could see disorganized and chaotic flight by Alawites to the coast, both uh, civilians and military. You know, that could be a pretty ugly uh, scenario. Scenario and kind of my, my favorite indicator, you know, would be the uh, burning of papers at the Iranian embassy. Right? <laughs> you know, we'll we'll know it's over when we see the smoke coming up out of the Iranian embassy. Uh, last point: I've been asked a lot of times uh, about turning point. You know, what's the turning point in, in the war? You know, when are we going to see a turning point? Now, to me, it's been about turning processes. Right? All all those trends I I talked about, but maybe the you know. And this is something to think about, but maybe the, the real turning point in the war was the July-August rebel offensive in Aleppo province mm -hmm. and then into Aleppo city and the failure of the regime to be able to retake the city. 
And that, Aleppo in a, in a sense became the Verdun or the Stalingrad for the, for the regime. Sucked in forces, attrited those forces in, in you know, pointless tactical battles uh, and, and actions, and really I think has weak, weakened the regime's ability to respond uh, to threats elsewhere in the country. So that concludes my portion of the, uh, the program. Thank you, Jeff. Andrew, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks for coming out um, for, uh, for lunch and for the discussion today. Um, I'm, uh, almost every conversation I've had um, over the last few days um, has been um, a very depressing one. I think Jeff alluded to that in his introduction as well. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's better to be honest than to, um, than, than, than at this point and to look at the situation um, and the cold reality. I just returned um, a few weeks back from a visit um, to Syrian border areas uh, near Rahanle uh, and uh, the sort of city right across the border, uh, Atme, uh, where there are a lot of refugees which are gathered in that area um, in the sort of no man's land and um, gray zone between the two countries. Um, and uh, it's, um, as Rob mentioned yesterday, um, I had a chance with a report by C.J. Shivers, um, as well as um, the deputy um, foreign editor at the um, New York Times, Michael Slackman, to, to talk a little bit about both what C.J. saw in Aleppo and the humanitarian situation there rapidly declining, and also um, a little bit about what I saw um, in, the, in the camps. And, and um, in, in including a number of um, uh, photographs and videos that I, that I took during that time. Um, like every trip that I've made to Syrian border regions over the last year, and I think this goes for my colleagues as well, the situation gets markedly worse. Um, at the, and this, uh, I think, has accelerated over the course of the last six months. Um, I'm, I use the metaphor of a hurricane, um, and if, if you accept that, um, I would say that the hurricane is growing in intensity um, um, and also in its, in, in its depth. Inside of the, the camp itself um, at Atme, um, and Atme sort of serves as the, I would say, one of, if not the informal capitals uh, of the Free Syrian Army, uh, certainly in Idlib or Aleppo province. It's technically in Aleppo province, but it borders Idlib. Uh, you have a lot of different katibas which are, act, which, are, which are present inside of the city, and adjacent to it on a hillside next to the technical fence with, with Turkey is the camp that, the word that I'm discussing today. Um, there you have about, you know, about 12,000 people um, with, uh, with very little shelter. Um, the day I was there, the Turks had uh, cut a big hole in the fence a few days before and were loading tents uh, through. They had, though, very little food. Uh, one packet of food in, uh, between four people and a packet consisted of a piece of bread, some rotten cheese, um, unfortunately, and um, the refugees pointed this out to me time and time again, some jam and, um, and a tomato. It was hardly enough. Um, it was one of those um, scenes um, at times like out of, um, uh, out of Afghanistan in the 80s in the sense that you would have a water buffalo that would be brought into the camp. Everyone would be running behind it with, um, with buckets or anything that they could put, um, collect water into. Uh, there were no toilets present in the camp and had not been for some time. Um, I wasn't exactly sure why this was the case, or why there was so little food. Uh, there were a number of charities which were trying to do, um, to launch a number of efforts uh, there. Um, and a number of those in the Syrian opposition, including those who are gathered around the Syria support group and some of their charities, uh, were, were, were active in the camp. And, uh, and I'd like to take my hat off to them in, in terms of what they were trying to do. But very clearly, the, uh, their, their efforts were um, you know, outpaced by the need of, 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 of the people in that area. Uh, disease has spread throughout um, Syria um, as the winter sets in. I think a lot of you know but um, in case you haven't spent a lot of time there, and, and actually in that part of the Middle East in the wintertime, it's very cold and it rains a lot. Um, and uh, it was um, troubling to see so many young children running around out in the rain, literally without, um, with, with, without um, uh, any kind of um, jackets, um, not, not nearly enough shelter. Um, uh, the mud was about up to my ankles. Um, and so your feet would kind of stick in the mud as you would try and walk through different parts of the camp. 
um, there had been torrential rains um, the, the, the days before, um, before I was um, in that area. If you go on the other side of the border, um, you'll find um, in, in the neighboring countries, you have about officially 450,000 refugees which are registered with the UNHCR. Um, but there are hundreds of thousands more, and in southern Turkey, you'll find them just living um, in various places, um, including in the in the border areas of um, of Atme. And they're, they're they're just not registered, but they're much better cared for. They have heat, they have washing machines, um, and um, and a number of neighboring countries have really done a great job um, in, in 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 trying to provide for them as best they best they could. And I think that the United States now is increasingly involved in that effort, um, although I think the the response has been a bit slow from our side. Um, there are about 1.5 million Syrians who are internally displaced within uh, within the country. So the little vision that we got from Atme is is, is just that um, you know a little window into the humanitarian suffering that will be going on throughout Syria. We already have children who are dying not only of disease but also of exposure. That's said to get that's said to get much worse um, as winter sets in. Uh, it also affects a number of refugee com communities already present in Syria, and I think a number of you have noticed the government's attack on the Yarmouk uh, Palestinian refugee camp, um, which is actually um, an environ, uh, actually it's a part of, of, you know, of Damascus, and um, um, I think you saw that, that, I think there were some announcements by the UNHCR um, that said about 100,000 Palestinians from that camp uh, were now on the move and looking for, um, looking for shelter. Um, and, um, and, and that not only included inside of Syria, but also uh, in neighboring countries. It's very understandable that um, given the, um, the long battle, the regime's brutality, winter setting in, um, that uh, people's nerves inside um, of the country are increasingly frayed, um, if not broken. Sectarianism uh, among those I spoke with um, was growing, but I was kind of surprised that it wasn't that, that it wasn't greater. Um, in fact, when I was in Antakya this time, um, there were many more Alawites who had defected from Syrian military intelligence and a number of other bodies. It was great to be able to speak with them a little bit about what was going on inside of their communities, um, and uh, and there was also a large call up of Alawite reserves during that time, so they were discussing that. So there are lots of signs of discomfort uh, among the the Alawi community, but until now. No major defections. Um, you know, we um, we have not had a senior Alawi official until now. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, who has defected from the Assad regime, who hasn't simultaneously defected from the planet. Um, and here we're talking about the 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 bombing last summer. Okay, that's pretty shocking, um, given the fact that the strategy was to try and crack the regime from the outside. That's very clearly it's um, as we expected, and I think those of us. You know, who have experience in the country know that that minority-dominated regimes are galvanized against uh, the kind of splits like we saw in Cairo and Tunisia. Doesn't mean ga galvanized steel can still break, but um, but in this case um, they haven't really to date. Within the opposition itself, and in, in terms of the armed opposition, and that's what Jeff and I have been looking at for the last uh, the last few months. Um, you can see that there is a general tip towards the right um, along the Islamist spectrum. Um, and uh, I get those reports both from journalists who go in, who um, I think it's very interesting that increasingly you'll find groups which were previously open to Western or outside journalists coming into areas who now are not so open to that, much more suspicious, no longer allow them to stay with their, uh, with their divisions. Um, and also we have, of course, the, the um, it general, generally I think this is not just because they're armed groups, um, and because of necessarily ideology, but um, because of the lack of a Western response, and specifically an American response to, to their needs. And I think they, they see it from across the spectrum. You can see these present in videos that have come out of Syria over the last few, um, few, few weeks, particularly a number of protests, for example, in Binnish, um, in Idlib province, um, which were not only um, anti-American, but also uh, against a civil state and demanding an Islamic state. Um, uh, you also see the rise, of course, of Jabhat al-Nusra um, uh, in, uh, in the northern parts of Syria and elsewhere. Um, and uh, disturbingly, over the last few weeks, um, uh, we saw a number of videos in which Jabhat al-Nusra members had SA-7s on their shoulders, um, not because they were delivered from the outside, but actually because they were, they were captured from government stocks. Um, so there were a lot of fears, of course, as we know earlier on, about 
arming groups within Syria. We were afraid that those weapons would get into the hands of extremists. They got into the hands of extremists anyway because um, those those groups grew in strength. They overran those military bases, and um, and and now we have the current situation. Uh, we have an in increased number of kidnappings of, um, of journalists. And I think Richard Engel's case um, is, is, is probably the most, the most recent, most noteworthy, although there are a number of others, um, including uh, the journalist who's been uh, kidnapped for some time, Austin Tice. Note that um, Richard Engel was um, uh, uh, rescued by Ahrar Hashem, um, a, um, a Salafist group which is active in Idlib province. I think it shows very much, um, I don't think it's by accident, I think it shows how strong those groups are in that area and I think that they will continue to be, particularly in Idlib and, and Aleppo province, will be a formidable force um, and, um, and seem to be the most funded and the most politically connected uh, within that area. And Jeff and I are working on a number of projects right now to sort of map out a little bit about what these groups mean politically. Ahrar Hashem is a big one. Um, Anti-American, anti-Western sentiment is growing, as I mentioned. You can find a number of videos um, to demonstrate this over the last few days. Um, that um, and last Friday, I believe, there were a series of protests against uh, U.S. inaction uh, in Syria. What's particularly noteworthy is um, this went at the same time as the Jabhat al-Nusra designation. So uh, the reason why the Jabhat al-Nusra designation is controversial is not because they designated Jabhat al-Nusra per se. Uh, it's because the Jabhat al-Nusra designation came before the U.S. recognition of SOC, uh, the Syrian Opposition Coalition, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Okay, so um, the designation of Jabhat al-Nusra um, by the U.S. first, and then the recognition of SOC later, um, actually ended up backfiring tremendously in the United States. Look, I, I'm not I'm not saying that Jabhat al-Nusra um, is not a is, is not a terrorist group, doesn't deploy terrorist activity uh, methods. Um, that's beside the point. The, the choice of designating it first before recognition of the formal body um, does not make sense for a context in which the United States has um, increasingly little um, power um, and authority in which to shape and influence events. Um, and I think is actually a lesson in what not to do, um, if, especially as we look as a post outside Syria. This would not be so worrisome if uh, large swaths of the country were not about ready to be taken over by rebel forces. Um, so, um, and I think Jeff outlined that better than I did. The uh, opposition remains very divided, and there are a number of things going on in the limelight and behind the scenes to bring the various factions together yet once again. Um, I don't need to explain to you the divisions within the Syrian opposition um, uh, in detail, but the Syrian opposition traditionally is divided um, not just by sect, and not just by class, not just by the rural urban divide, but most importantly is mostly divided by personalities. Um, remember this is a, and a no, number of friends here laughing in the audience, um, the reason, when you're oppressed for that long and you emerge from that kind of milieu, in the milieu I lived in, um, one of the first um, things when, when the depression is thrown off is grandiosity, unfortunately. And it means working together is, is, is very difficult. There's an, so we, we had, we've had two, um, uh, activities that are going on, one with the civilian opposition and one with the armed opposition, and they go in tandem. Um, the first, of course, was the Syrian Opposition Coalition meeting in Doha in early November, which uh, elected a 65-member council, um, which is essentially an umbrella organization. Within that organization, um, which is led by Muaz al-Khatib, is another umbrella organization, the Syrian National Council which still holds about 40% of the seats. And within the Syrian National Council are a collection of liberals, Salafists, and Muslim Brotherhood members. Okay, so um, 14 of the members are from local councils, but those 14 representatives were not elected by local councils. Just to put this into perspective, there was one representative from every Syrian muhafaza, which is a province, equivalent of a state, okay? Um, and so it, by definition, it would be, for example, if we had a, something similar here, it would be as if we had one representative, I, I, if I was the representative from the local council of Pennsylvania from where I'm from. Um, people within that muhafaza did not select those members. They were selected from the outside. It's told by many members of the opposition who were angry of not being included um, that Qatar played a very large role in that. Um, in any case, the new organization has more penetration inside of the country, but, um, but, it's, but it's far from clear exactly how that's going to function. 
Now, beginning precisely at the, on the same day as the SOC conference and ending on the same day as the SOC conference was another conference which, which took place nearby, which was not covered in the media, and that was of military councils, and it was also in Doha. Um, in fact, when I was in the area, it was very hard to see members of military councils because they were all in Qatar. Um, and that eventually bore fruit um, in the announcement a few days ago on December 7th in Antalya of the creation of the Supreme Military Council, which was completely predictable um, because it was part of the plan of the, the original SOC plan um, that was put forward um, um, by a number of um, members of the opposition. Uh, 260 Katiba and Lua commanders met in Antalya and they selected a 30-member council miraculously by consensus. And they selected Chief of Staff General Salim Adris um, uh, as, um, as their nominal head. <coughs> the idea behind the creation of the Supreme Military Council was that that part, distinct from SOC somehow, but somehow related in terms of the schedule of the meetings, uh, would allow the funneling of weapons inside of the country that would then stay away from or would be channeled away from extremist groups and would create dependencies with mainline groups that would allow them to uh, better uh, uh, both fight the regime and, in the, and eventually um, to control the areas in which they operate. Um, the question is with the, the pace of the regime's a collapse in the number of military bases that have been overrun, there are a lot of questions whether th that dependency model will, will indeed work. Um, because frankly, there are just a lot of weapons that are now out there and they, didn't have, they did not have to be delivered by the Supreme Military Council or the regional military councils which, which, these, which the SMC represents. It's also not clear to me how these two formations, both SOC and the Supreme Military Council, will function together. Okay, and it all comes down to, because we're looking here at some sort of end game, at least some sort of um, end of one phase of the battle and perhaps the beginning of another. Um, it's unclear to me to this day, and I, I look at this every day, exactly um, when push comes to shove, um, who controls what areas. Are they armed groups? Are they civilian groups? There's a, every, every province and every area, and an area is the, the rough equivalent of a division, like a county in the United States or a parish. Um, is a little different. In some areas, the FSA forms the local councils. In other areas, local councils are already present and then works with the FSA. Um, so the, the battle between civilians and armed groups um, in terms of battle for influence is, is continuing. And, um, and just to show you that this still does not, seem to be, to, does not seem to be decided, yesterday a joint statement by the chief of staff of the, of the Syrian Military Joint Command, um, which is General... Um, Salim Idris and the ANSOC, uh, President Ahmed Mouaz Al Khatib, um, uh, w w was released. Um, it talked about the struggle for freedom in Syria. A meeting was held, um, and the president and the members of, the, of SOC um, and the Joint Military Command they reaffirmed their they'd like to topple the regime, dismantling the security forces, empowering the Syrian people. Um, but there's very little there about exactly how that would work, um, and uh, there's a lot of concern about. Um, uh, how this is going to unfold um, over time. Um, and uh, it's something that everybody should watch, uh, particularly because I think there's a lot of optimism out there about these new structures working very well and perfectly. I think it's a good thing that, that these announcements are made. I think it's a good thing that these meetings are taking place. I see no evidence to date, and it is early, um, that um, these structures will be able to come overcome the very real divisions within the Syrian opposition. As Rob talked about, and concerning is the end near in Damascus, um, I think that, w that one phase of the battle is over, but I don't think the, the struggle or the war um, over Syria um, uh, will be complete for some time. One of the most important things um, going forward uh, will be trying to bridge the civilian and military divide um, within Syria, and most importantly for the United States to gain influence within that environment. I believe that given the divisions within the opposition and the fact that the armed opposition is making gains faster than expected, perhaps not faster than I expected, maybe not than Jeff expected, um, I believe that those that are taking the shots against Assad will be calling them once he is gone, at least in the interim, uh, as we get towards elections. Um, and uh, that does not mean civilians will, will not play a role. It just means that I think, um, you know, to quote Al Capone, you can get much further with um, a, a kind word and a, and a gun than just with a kind word. 
and I think, by the way, this this has no, this has no reflection on on Syrian sentiments. It's just the realities of the security situation in those areas. I think to expect activists who we have good contacts with, who are good people, but uh, do not have many political skills um, and no ability to provide security, for them to be able to to manage those areas um, without um, without without military groups, I think is is I I, I just don't think it would work. The U.S. has spent considerable time and effort over the last year working with Syria's civilian-led opposition concerning humanitarian issues and preparations for a post-Assad Syria while keeping armed groups at arm's length. While these plans are often well thought out, the pace of the army advances indicates that the Syrian opposition could push the Assad regime's forces out of large parts of Syria completely in the coming weeks. Now, whether you know, Jeff outlined a number of scenarios, we have a bet um, going, uh, or uh, one where the where the winner has to take the loser to lunch and pay for it, um, where um, you know we're looking at a lot of different scenarios here: complete collapse, um, uh, some kind of concerted collapse. It could just be something that's chaotic, um, and I think Jeff outlined those very well. But in the end, I think for the United States, it's important to achieve its objectives and get and to make sure that its plans for a post-Assad Syria stick, and that we achieve this strategic objective of ensuring that the Syrian revolution is not hijacked solely by armed gangs and extremists. So ironically. The United States, in my opinion, will have to engage directly with armed groups that are set to take over liberated areas of Syria. While the regime's forces seem close to the breaking point in large parts of Syria, the Assad regime, either as an organized force or a reconstituted Alawi-led popular army, and I think many of you know that Iran and Hezbollah are very active in this, um, in transforming the Shabiha in the country, the irregular forces, into what's called the Jaysh al-Shabi, or popular army. They may be positioned to fight in one form or another for some time in different parts of Syria and whether it's on the Syrian coast, around Damascus, and so on. Um, it will be um, not only to, to maintain their grip on the country, but also probably to maintain the security and the safety of the, of the Alawi population and the other minorities, um, and those also who support the regime. Armed groups in Syria are therefore likely to continue to need and request external assistance in order to take down the regime, and humanitarian assistance as well, um, as not only as winter sets in, but as the real effects of the conflict um, become clear. And I think, you know, those of you who saw the Times cast video yesterday and saw children breaking apart their desks and burning the wood for, for heat, um, that was a, a, um, a terrible scene. Um, and um, combined with the, 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 the very gory videos that have come out over the, over the last few days as well, um, also involving children, um, uh, obviously Syria is going to need a lot more humanitarian assistance, um, which is also an opportunity for the United States. If, if such assistance is channeled correctly, and here we're talking about the armed assistance, via local, uh, uh, armed and civilian, sorry, in terms of weapons and humanitarian assistance, if it's channeled correctly via local councils organized in Syria and Manatic, or areas, or the equivalent of counties or parishes, the U.S. will be better able to overcome the questions uh, concerning um, the arming strategies uh, of a number of co regional countries in Syria. Um, and uh, here the Syrian opposition is particularly alarmed by um, the role of a number of individuals who have funneled money into Syria and assistance, as well as um, some concerns over exactly um, what kind of assistance had been provided by Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. And that this would boost, um, by, by doing this and by actually working with the local councils, it would boost the role of more secular units at the expense of extremists, if we were very clear, and ultimately allow Washington to better shape an outcome in Syria that is both peaceful uh, and democratic. But of course, into this rapidly changing scenario, there are no guarantees. Uh, I think, though, under the under the circumstances, dealing through um, uh, third parties um, and not dealing directly with um, with all elements of the Syrian opposition, I think the the um, the chance for the U.S. signaling to become distorted um, and our intentions to become distorted before the Syrian opposition um, will only increase. Um, dealing directly, um, both with civilian and armed groups. Uh, would help bridge that gap um, and help us shape a post-Assad Syria. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Andrew and Jeff. Um, let me open with, uh, with two questions. First, uh, a question that I assume is on the minds of many people in terms of Jeff's presentation. Two words that you didn't mention, Jeff, are chemical weapons. Um, uh, um, are there circumstances in any of those five scenarios in which you can imagine the Syrian uh, regime using them? Uh, toward what aim? What impact would it have? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then 
more broadly, both of you opened your presentations with, with a reference to how depressing the situation is. Um, let me ask you the sort of devil's advocate or counterintuitive position, which is, well, this isn't depressing at all. The regime's about to fall. Not only is the regime about to fall, but the regime's about to fall without the United States having to uh, invest much in it. Isn't this precisely the achievement of what U.S. policy for the last year and a half was designed to, um, to do? Uh, bring Assad down without our fingerprints, without our blood or treasure um, uh, being spent along the way. Why shouldn't we hear these presentations and cheer? Gentlemen. Okay, let me talk about the, the C, CW issue. Um, I, I think we actually may have been close to CW use uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in, in, in based on what, you know, what we heard allegedly coming out of U.S. intelligence sources and so on, it looked like the regime may have been uh, preparing for use uh, and, and then uh, ba backed off from uh, doing that. I, uh, you know, that's not sure. Uh, you know, that's, that's just kind of, kind of my assessment. And I, I'm thinking not only because of what, what we saw and what they did and the handling of, of the munitions and so on, uh, but also the context that occurred in. And, and that was in a lot of rebel fighting close to Damascus and in, inside Damascus and the threat to Damas Damascus International Airport. And the regime may have been moving, t you know, towards using them because they, they thought that the rebels were just getting too close and the situation uh, was turning too much against them. So I think, you know, I used to say that I did not believe the regime would use chemical weapons against its own people. I don't believe that anymore. I believe they, you know, they may well use it against their own people. Uh, in extremis, uh, which they were pretty close to uh, dur during that fighting, um, it could be rogue use. Uh, a commander with both the weapons and access to the means to uh, de deploy them could use them. Uh, so I think we, it could be a demonstration use uh, to, you know, terrorize the population in a given area, try and break the link between the, uh, the civilian population and the, uh, and the armed elements and so on. Or it could be, you know, an actual tactical or military operational use to try and you know, stop something or to achieve a, and achieve a change uh, in the military situation. So, you know, I think we should be prepared to see that happen. Uh, I don't believe this stuff about the secret vans, you know, driving around Syria, mixing chemicals in the back, uh, story that came out, and I, I don't think that's true. I think that's very unlikely. They've got all the technology they need for handling chemical weapons. It was a main uh, weapon they intended to use against the Israelis under, under some circumstances, and they know all about, all about handling, so handling them. So I think we may have been close. Um, and as I said, I think we should be prepared to see it uh, you know, happen, not be surprised by it. It may not happen, but I don't think uh, we should be surprised. Uh, the Scud firings may have been related to that. You know, firing Scuds with high explosive warheads and you know, light infantry type forces that are dispersed is not a very uh, you know, effect effective use of, of that kind of weapon. But that might have been a signal um, that they have the, have the capability to use those kinds of weapons. And so that might also play in, in, into the, uh, the chemical, warf chemical warfare uh, story. Um, I, we'll have to see on that. That might have been a signal both to the West and to the, uh, and to the regime's allies as well. On the issue of uh, should we be happy or not, before I turn over to Andrew, uh, you know, I, I think we should be happy, right? I mean, a lot, a lot of people are getting killed in, in Syria every day, maybe close to 200 a day by, by some counts. Uh, so this, this is not a, you know, a, a pleasant ex exper experience. The war needs to end. Uh, whatever's going to happen after it's over, it, it's going to happen. And there'll be killing, and there'll be violence, and revenge killings, and sectarian killings, and all those things. But I doubt if you'll have 200 people a day being killed. I doubt if you'll have the use of incendiary weapons against civilians. I doubt if you'll see the use of fragmentation weapons routinely uh, against civilians. It'll be different. It'll be nasty and ugly, but this particular nasty and ugly regime will be gone. And with it, the linchpin of the Iranian position in the region, you know, the Hezbollah strategic position and so on. So I think we should be happy. The last thing I think we want now is a UN brokered ceasefire. That is hugely to the regime's advantage. 
and we should avoid that at all at, at all costs. Just before you leave, Jeff, um, uh, on the CW question, uh, is there any evidence that uh, the Obama administration's red line on CW has had any impact on uh, the decision making or operations of the regime? Uh, I, I can't say, but you know, I just don't have you know that, that kind of access uh, you know, to, to what the regime is thinking. But it's a pink line, right? And, it, and it's a broad line, right? And, and it's kind of a movable line, maybe. So uh, my sense is probably did not greatly affect the, the Syrian regime. Andrew? Yeah, just getting to, to Rob's um, question, I think, you know, um, in, in looking at this, and I know there are a number of people who who have argued that that somehow that the Obama administration policy on Syria was, has been a success. Uh, probably Aaron David Miller is the probably the biggest proponent of that of that view. Um, certainly, the regime coming down after 21 months of intense fighting and brutality and all the videos that I uh, that I've seen um, does not look to me like a victory. Perhaps, um, and it's not something that w is a, a positive outcome. The regime going is a positive outcome. Um, the, the way it goes, though, is important for shaping a post-Assad Syria. And I think that's where we really lost. Um, and, and I think when I say we, I meant the United States. I think it's allies. Um, it's hard to see how, um, how, how the post-Assad Syria um, will be easily shaped by the United States. I think we're not going to be a player. I think it was an opportunity. And, you know, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, for example, that Aaron put that idea forward because so much effort was placed out of the peace process circles on flipping Syria all these years, right? You get them to sign a peace treaty with Israel. They somehow then miraculously re reorient them from, you know, themselves from Iran and the secular state in Syria is saved. Why didn't that formula continue with the current conflict? So I'm a little surprised it actually comes out of those circles. Um, I, my sense is that we, that you know, in retrospect, we're going to look back and wish that we had done something more creative in Syria, that we had tried to shape the outcome. Um, and I think that that there's a chance that, you know, very realistic chance that it's not just that we could have a Assad regime which is hostile to U.S. interests and diametrically opposed to. Um, you know, to, uh, to, to the U.S., its allies, and also aligned with Iran. But we could actually have more than one Syria for a while that is also opposed to U.S. interests, um, just in a completely different way. And granted, those two factions might be fighting each other, um, but our ability to shape that outcome has been significantly reduced. And I think that the, the humanitarian toll, um, I don't think that actually a lot of what's happening in Syria is generated by ideology. I think it's just generated by a lot of resentment of, of by Syrians of being abandoned when they were in their hour of need. Um, it's actually, uh, it doesn't explain every group's choices, um, but a number of commanders, in, both in the civilian, or in, the, in the armed opposition and also activists, I completely understand their anger. There were some things about Syria that were worth salvaging. Um, the, the secular nature um, of the state, um, um, is something that perhaps wouldn't have lasted forever, given a reconstitution of its of its political identity, um, but could have been better managed, um, and perhaps with the with a more peaceful tran transition earlier and a more concerted effort, um, there would have been a chance to save that state. I don't think there's really much a chance of saving it at this point, um, and that could lead to fragmentation and the chances of of different problems which come from that conflict. Spilling beyond Syria's borders, I think, is going up considerably. Uh, refugees, um, and here we're talking about the humanitarian aspects, um, also could be with strategic weapons. Um, a lot of the chemical weapons, which Jeff had mentioned, or which Rob had asked about, um, there's the risk of the regime using them, um, and there have been reports about that. There's also the risk that those areas could be overrun by groups that um, could, could use them in different ways. Um, th these are very technical details, right? Um, but the risks are there, um, and uh, that, I think, is another reason why the U.S. should have acted earlier. Um, the question now, though, is how to shape the outcome going forward. And um, the, you know, the, the question is, is it, are we going to continue to take a hands-off approach and hope for the best, um, or is more concerted action um, at this point um, preferable and doable? Um, I think the latter, and I, I know a, a number of others in the policy community are are coming around to that way of thinking. The question is, you know, will that 
will those similar ideas, you know, be implemented by the administration? At, the, at this point, I can't tell. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's open the floor for your uh, questions and, uh, and observations. Uh, Howard Teicher here on my left. Um, Jeff, to, to your sort of closing thought Howard, about... Howard, take the mic, please. To your closing thought about looking for the smoke from the Iranian embassy, do you think we're seeing the limits of Iranian intervention, whether direct or indirect, through Lebanon? And if we're not, how far do you think the Iranians will go to preserve their position? Because clearly, we can have a whole other discussion about the regional consequences in every direction uh, for Iran uh, of the different outcomes that you've described. I, I think we're, you know, we've seen the limit of Syria or of um, Iranian military intervention. They're not going to do anything greater, uh, anything significantly different. The Iranians, they're not going to fly in revolutionary guards and you know, try and save the regime. Uh, they might send an airplane to try and get Assad out, uh, but we're not, I, I don't think we're going to see you know, any you know, grand Iranian military in, involvement in the conflict. I think they understand the limits, the you know, geographic limits of what we're talking about, and they almost certainly don't want to commit their forces into a losing situation where they would be caught up in a collapse and defeat of, of the government. Uh, that, you know, that's my view on that. Hezbollah might be a little different. We might see increased Hezbollah involvement because they can run across the border you know, much more readily in a, uh, in a colli collapsing situation. Diplomatically, though, I think, and I'm not an Iranian a policy expert at all, so I'm, I'm cautious, right? But diplomatically, I think we might see more, more involvement by Iran, right? They might, they might become part of an effort to save the regime, you know, at the end, to get some kind of ceasefire in place, to you know, cook up some kind of, you know, negotiated uh, solution to try and save the regime, or at least part of it, get a halt to the fighting, allow the regime to, you know, start, you know, rebuilding, you know, rebuilding uh, reestablishing itself. But on the military side, I don't see it. I think, I think that's, a, that's done. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, side, Eric in the back. Thank you very much. Eric from al -Quds. My question to you, uh, Mr. White, you said that uh, we are likely to see Germany in 1918. Could you elaborate uh, on that, and uh, how will that impact? After all, Israel, uh, Syria is at a state of war with Israel. How will that impact small groups, you know, sort of ad hocing on their own and so on? And uh, a quick uh, question to uh, to Andrew: Why do you think such a heavy investment by Qatar and Saudi Arabia into the, the thing in Syria is it based on sectarian uh, interest? Thank you. Um. Uh, in, in March 1918, in a situation is, you know, basically you had for the German army held out extremely well throughout the war, looked like it was winning at, at various points. Even in March of 1918, uh, you, you had the, uh, the big offensive in, in, in the West. They defeated the Russians, basically. Uh, so up until March of 1918, they looked pretty strong. And then, you know, the offensives, of the Allied offensives in the fall basically, you know, started to push the army towards uh, collapsing. It began to un unravel. The political situation in Berlin also began to unravel. You started to have mutinies in, in the forces and so on. So, you know, there's no p perfect uh, historical uh, parallel. But this, to me, kind of looks like that, right? That the, the forces have been stretched to the limit. And when they break, they're not going to just break, you know, in a, in a fractional, you know, in a small way. They're probably going to break big, uh, you know, in, on a large scale. Uh, as far as the... Um, you know, the impact on the Arab-Israeli situation is, well, you know, just on, you know, on, on the military side, right, this is going to, this war is taking Syria out of that equation as a military component for a long time, right? Now, you know, you know the Israelis used to like to divide things up into current security threats and basic security threats, right? Uh, Syria was always a basic security threat, you know, to the state of Israel. Okay, that threat is going away here for some time, I think. The, the current security threat of terrorists or people trying to infiltrate the border or shooting rockets across the border, you know, that might go up. That's been very quiet, you know, basically since the 73 war. That kind of threat, you know, might increase for the Israelis. So you have tensions on the, on the Golan front, rockets coming back and forth, or basically one way, bombs going the other way. 
I uh, mean, you know, some infiltration attempts, uh, that kind of stuff. But a current security problem that the Israelis know how to deal with very effectively. Okay, but the strategic threat of, of a general war with Syria, I think, goes way down uh, because of the wreck. Because of the wreck that the Syrian military is going to be at the end of the situation. Um, I think that the reason why Qatar, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, and all the other parties, the reason why they're pursuing their interests in Syria is because they would like to shape the outcome there and have influence. Um, now, does that plug into a sectarian um, framework? I think oftentimes it does. Um, you know, Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Turkey are um, are are Sunni Muslim countries. Uh, the regime there in, in, in Syria is ruled by, um, by Alawis and it's, it's aligned with Iran. So, you know, those countries compete with each other um, and against Iran. Um, and I, I think that's what they're trying to achieve. Uh, so, the, you know, so, so basically there's, um, there's that. Now, the question is, well, you know, towards what end? Well, it could be for influence, it could be for um, uh, various um, aspects of, of each one of those countries' foreign policies. There are also economic interests. The, the Syrian regime, um, I have this via a friend, um, let's just put it via a friend, who said that the Syrian, this, the Syrian regime, the Assad regime is obsessed with one idea, and that is Qatar wants to put a gas pipeline across Syria through Turkey to compete with Russian gas. And, um, and they apparently, they are obsessed with this idea. Um, and, and do not make it a secret. Um, whether that's the case, I don't know. You know, governments in Syria used to be overthrown all the time because uh, one country or another wanted to put an oil pipeline then across their territory. Um, could, could we be, you know, uh, returning to that, that, that time? Uh, Syria is, is very important geographically. It's resource poor, but, um, but geographically, um, you know, it's a keystone. And, um, and I think that that's the, 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 those are some of the general reasons why the, the countries in the region pursue their interests there. Uh, Jerry Brewer. Jeff, a little role playing. Assume you are Assad's military commander and you've just given him the same net assessment you gave us. And Assad says to you, okay, I understand, I'm not leaving, what should I do? <laughs> well, if he... You know, one would be to negotiate, right? But I, I'm this is, but this will, well, my advice as a military commander, you know, might well be to negotiate, see what you can get. If you're assuming you're not absolutely not going to, you know, not going to leave, okay. Um, if if that, if he won't go for negotiations, then he he needs to do the try the control contraction scenario. That is to systematically pull back forces to whatever ever area of the country he wants to defend. You know, Syrian strategy from the beginning of the war has been to defend everything, not to give up on anything, basically. Any province, let's say, or any major city. And that strat strategy has killed them, you know, in a, in a military sense. It may have been smart politically, it was lethal, uh, I, th I think, military, uh, militarily. Now, whether or not that he could do it, I don't know. The, the third option I give him is, you know, CW. See if you can shock the situation enough that you know everyone comes rushing in to get that ceasefire and you know with their hands over their heads saying we have to end the war right now. But uh, as a military commander, you know, contract, pull back, consolidate, see if we can hang on. Uh, Michael Gordon in front. Uh, question uh, for just use the, the mic heading your way. <laughs> a question for Jeff White. You, you've described a, a rather fast-paced, uh, fast-moving situation in which the opposition's making gains regime could crack in a matter of weeks or months. Um, there's been a debate in Washington over arming. Is, is that debate been overtaken by events on the ground, given that the rebels are capturing weapons and employing them? Is there, is there still a case for arming at, at this stage from a military perspective? And if you were in charge of doing that, how would how specifically would you go about arming the opposition? Yeah, I, I, I said this in, in my remarks that I, I think the rebels have achieved a self-sustaining you know capability here. They don't actually need. Uh, there, there's a couple things that are useful to them. The rear area that Turkey provides is, is highly used to them, use, useful for them. 
But in terms of, uh, of arms and ammunition, uh, I don't think they need much. Uh, maybe nothing, uh, actually, at this point, given, given all the stuff we've uh, we, we seen, we seen them uh, acquire from, from the regime. And they're acquiring more stuff from the regime you know, all, all the time. So you know, my sense is that that story may be over, right, of, of trying to get arms in to help them bring down the regime. I think, I think they can bring the regime down on their own. Uh, but there is a point, I think, in pr to providing them with arms, and it's what Andrew talked about in some of his remarks, and that is we need to start thinking now about the day after, you know, fall plus one, right? We need to start thinking about what's the military situation going to look like and who do we want to be the most effective military forces on the ground when the regime falls. And we want that to be guys we like, guys who like us, not these other guys, you know, that are getting all the publicity. So there is a point in providing them uh, military assistance. In, in my mind, that should be a package of military assistance, not just shoveling weapons to them, right? They, they, some weapons would be useful, anti-tank weapons <coughs> would, would be useful, and aircraft weapons would, would still be useful. It would help the rebels speed up, the, uh, speed up their efforts. But there's all kinds of other stuff they could use, you know, you know training, advice, intelligence, uh, you know, simply how to organize better, how to put together a command post that can operate multiple units, those kinds of things that should be, you know, part of a you know, general military assistance package to units that we like or like us, you know, kind of thing. So I still think there's a point in it. Okay. Um, yes, Dan Sherwood. Daniel, sir, we're from Johns Hopkins Sites. Andrew, I wonder if I could invite you to think about the day after a little bit more, not only in terms of the Army, but, uh, you know, it's arguable that our influence at that point will be rather large. And, you know, a future in which Qatari and Iraqi pipelines cross Syria to take resources to Europe isn't the worst thing that I can think of. So how do we... What do we do uh, I the day after to increase our influence and use it? That's an excellent question. Um, I think it, immediately it's cut the red tape. Um, I don't, there's a lot of frustration. Oh, like, let, let me back up. Let's go back to the camp. So. You're, you're, in, you're in a camp which, in which people are in, are, are in deep need, and we're, and we're going to have people from all over Syria who, who are in need for, for food, for shelter, all these different things, and um, the battle for, and I hate to say it, hearts and minds, um, uh, is, already, is, you know, is, is already there. And while, and while in the command tent there, and speaking with those who were in charge of the, um, who were in charge of the camp, um, as much as anybody could be in charge of the camp at that point, um, uh, in walked um, a Libyan. Uh, his name is Abu Omar, and uh, Abu Omar began speaking in classical Arabic, and he began saying, and the, of course, he saw the same need there that I did, and he said that he was a Syrian, but had lived in Libya. He didn't seem like a Syrian, um, and he, um, he, he noticed also that they didn't have any food. He also noticed that they didn't have any toilets, um, and he noticed about the spread of disease, and he was immediately talking about getting those supplies, those kind of things in there, and was trying to organize uh, the camp. Um, you know, uh, our ability to project aid into those areas so far, I think, has been constrained. I think a number of people who work in policy would share that view, um, and I think a number of who work in the now that doesn't mean that assistance isn't on the way. Um, so it's true that it's not just going to be, and that's why I included humanitarian assistance in my comments. It's certainly not just weapons. It's certainly not just uh, security assistance, but will also involve every other thing that the United States can um, can provide. Now, the, um, the question is, um, you know, are we willing to do that and, um, or, are, or, or will Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey um, uh, solidify its influence in those areas by providing it first and will the Syrians be more apt to take it because, um, because the United States had not provided it before? I, I really don't know. There's an opportunity for the United States. I just think that our ability to, we, we, we just don't seem to be as quick or is agile at responding to the needs of this situation. And I think also our priorities are just, in, in, until now, the administration's priorities are markedly different. I think the sequencing, not the merit, but the sequencing of the JN designation before SOC recognition is an indication of that. Um, I think that in such an environment, 
um, that, that, that the countries, the Saudis and the Turks are just much better able to play it politically. Um, and so we need to think a little bit about how to deploy these, you know, such assistance. There's a lot of USAID assistance that will be going uh, into Syria soon um, in various forms. Um, we're going to need a lot more. Uh, but ultimately, and Jeff and I have talked about this time and time again, I think that we need to do direct engagement. I think that it has to be overt and not covert. I think it has to involve the State Department. I think it has to involve State Department officials on the ground and those of other U.S. government agencies. Um, there are safety concerns, though, and particularly um, such robust diplomacy, which Chris Stevens uh, was perhaps one of the best examples, does have risks, and we'll have to, we'll have to deal with those risks. But otherwise, I, th I think if we don't deal with it directly um, um, and with these groups directly in all forms, um, that we're, we're setting ourselves up for a fall. Uh, Patrick, here in front. Here, just use this. No. Uh, Andrew, you said that uh, after Assad falls, those who are now taking the shots will be calling the shots. Could you walk through a little bit how you see the restoration of the rule of law and <laughs> security in this post-Assad uh, Syria? And uh, you said that that would be true at least until the elections. Uh, I'm skeptical that after the elections that uh, those who have built up the structures in, uh, a, um, in a province or in a city are going to be that eager to hand it over to somebody who parachutes in from Morocco or Cairo or the like, uh, no matter what the votes say. Uh, and I'd be interested in your thoughts about the challenges that a new uh, national government in, in Syria will have in uh, integrating these various different forces into uh, new structures. I mean, presumably the army and quite possibly other state institutions will have to be rebuilt entirely from scratch. Yeah. yeah, it's a really long answer to a very good question. Um, inside of Syria, every crossroads, every hilltop, every area is a different katiba or liwa that flies a different flag. Below that flag, could be the Free Syrian Army flag or, or the liberated, the, the sort of Free Syria flag, which I think you've seen, um, which is reconstituted, I believe, from the 50s. Um, and so um, in that environment, you're going to have different groups which are prominent in that area taking over different, different areas um, or, um, or, or that. Okay, you have province level subdivisions which are called areas, um, and then there are further uh, nahi, which are further subdivisions like townships. Uh, we could have multiple leaders prominent um, when the regime falls. For example, in Idlib, um, we could have scores of them. How they would be consolidated, consolidated is a very good question. What we do know is that Lewa and Katibas have different divisions. They have security divisions. They have political arms. Um, and they work in various capacities with civilians. But the, the, the problem comes in of who creates what first and who, who reports to who, who reports to whom. As I said before, in some areas, the civilians had local councils and they worked together with the Katibas in that area. In some areas, the Katibas themselves set up the local councils. Um, so the question is, um, so in, in the immediate aftermath, you're going to have to deal with multiple scores, perhaps even hundreds of different individuals, um, which ultimately is not just a military operation, but, it, but is a political operation and involves political outreach. Um, trying to get them to, to, to sign on to a common agenda is something I think right now both SOC and the Supreme Military Council, as I mentioned, are trying to do. Um, but the question is, how exactly are those two groups going to work together um, to implement and, and to get some of these plans we've worked on for a post-Assad Syria to stick? So I think in the immediate aftermath and some of those things that Jeff outlined, I think you're looking at something very chaotic and kind of scary, frankly. And we're probably going to see it because the videos will continue to come out. Um, and then I think you'll see a real effort by a number, and, and you will see Syria um, um, for, for a time look much more like the map of Syria in 1923, um, in, which you, in which you have different parts of the country which are dominated by different uh, sects, but perhaps with the exception here of you're, you're going to have some Kurdish areas which are distinct from, uh, from, from Arab-dominated areas. Um, and into that, um, in, 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 into that mess, uh, I think a lot will... Politically, for these groups, um, the opportunity to, to solidify elites, I think, um, among the different commanders and among the different people who support them, will come um, in fighting the regime. So actually, the, a, a, longer, um, a longer fight against the regime might, might help politically solidify these groups into something more manageable. 
if the regime very quickly collapses, as one of the scenarios that Jeff outlined, it might be, it might be much, much more chaotic in a post-Assad Syria. Um, but ultimately, I don't know, because I don't, um, I don't, I don't uh, try to look into crystal balls uh, any more than I have to. But just stay here just for a second. Let me just pursue one, one um, sort of disconnect. You've, you've, pick, you've depicted chaos, essentially, maybe dissolution of the state into different regions. Given the post-Benghazi ARB environment in Washington, the chances that we start sending American diplomats, American AID people, even American soldiers um, representing the U.S. government into this environment seems awfully remote to me. Mm -hmm. And so um, isn't, it, is, isn't it a reasonable presumption that for, for a significant period of time, even after the demise of the Assad regime, we're still going to be bystanders? We're not going to be very much on the ground precisely because of the chaos that you just described, mm -hmm. which means that the, the first serious foundations of the post-Assad system will also be done outside our involvement, just like the way the regime is collapsing, essentially outside our involvement. Right. Well, uh, it's a good point. Um, but I think that uh, you could very simply just do what Jeff and I do, and that is go to border areas, and the commanders come out all the time, um, and you can talk with them. You can develop relationships with them um, of various sorts. So there's, there, there's that opportunity. I also think that a lot of liberated areas of Syria will not be as chaotic as, as others. And, and as there are some areas I think there will be real hotbeds for extremism, and there will be a lot of violence. I think other areas, the chances of that are lower. Um, it w we'd have to just look at the situation. If it, and this is what you know, anybody here who's a journalist um, or actually works in any field knows, when you, when you go into the field, you look at the, is the situation. Is, is it an active uh, environment? Um, are, you know, what, what are the risks? Um, but I think that um, the political outreach um, can, can take place from border areas. Um, and, uh, and I think it should be done overtly, not covertly. Because I think it's very hard in a post-Assad Syria, I don't think the Syrian opposition, you know, you, you have to, yeah, I, I think it's very hard for them to follow what they don't understand. If things are, if things are handled completely in the, in, the, in the covert realm, and I think a lot of this struggle is handled in the, in, the, in the covert area, I think it's just harder for them to follow. It's harder also for us to get credit. And I think we do start, need to start getting credit um, for whatever we do in Syria. If we're trying to do the right thing, I think we should be very forthright about it. And, um, um, I think that's a strategy that can win the post-Assad Syria uh, environment. Um, and, um, and I think we need to, 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 to start thinking about that now. Okay, let's, let's take a series of, um, of questions. I know a lot of people want to get into this debate, uh, and then I'll ask these guys to comment. Um, Liz Sly, Hillel Fradkin, Dan Pollack, and Cliff May. If you could uh, ask some brief questions, and then I'll ask my colleagues to respond. I was concerned about the ceasefire possibilities. Real quickly, mainly for Jeff, why would the rebels agree to any such ceasefire absent the chemical weapons? Uh, <coughs> Hello, Fratkin of the Hudson Institute. Uh, I, I wanted to um, ask uh, Mr. White and to say a bit more about the, the possibilities that have ar arisen in the uh, question period. We talked, on the one hand, the, about the possibility of a a controlled contraction. What, um, going back to Mr. Bremer's question, what would you recommend the, the best place to contract to and, 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 and how? And similarly, um, the, the, well, this is part of the militias. I mean, now, uh, it c is there any pattern of their control that you would say the, re the country is dividing up into certain areas? Go ahead. There's a mic. Kate C. the uh, Middle East Institute. A quick question for um, Andrew. I was going to ask Jeff a question, but I'll stick to one. Um, the national coalition is only going to be as um, credible on the ground in Syria as it is effective on the ground in Syria. And obviously one of the first challenges will be facilitating the of, of aid and food and fuel to the suffering Syrians. But my question to you is, could you s briefly spell out then what you think are the priorities of the NC in the next two or three months in order to gain the credibility to appear to be the legitimate representative of the Syrian people as it has been termed? And does it look like they've got the, the capabilities and the ability to, to achieve these priorities? Thank you. Uh, Cliff. 
you both suggested, and correctly, I, I think that Qatar and Turkey and Saudi Arabia are likely to be most influential in terms of shaping the post-Assad environment. And probably the Obama administration is not uncomfortable with that outcome. If that happens, the, is the implication that we're going to see uh, a Muslim Brotherhood or Salafi government take shape? And if that happens, can we assume that the Druze, the Kurds, the Christians, the Alawites will attempt to resist the, that sort of government? And if so, do we assist those trying to resist a government that we've sort of allowed to come to place by empowering our allies to shape the environment? Okay, gentlemen. Easy questions, we have four and a half minutes. <laughs> I'll take the, the first two at least. Uh, why would the rebels agree to a ceasefire? Uh, I don't think they will. I don't think they would have any intention of doing that. You know, sh chemicals might uh, change that depending upon how they're employed, but I tend to doubt even that. Um, so I don't think from the rebel side there's probably no interest in a ceasefire and if one was negotiated it would be violated uh, by both sides, but, but the rebels would certainly uh, be violated. On the contract, contraction um, scenario, I don't think that's likely, okay? That was a recommendation that I was making as a military uh, you know, commander. I, do, I don't think it's likely. There's two, you know, two options, sort of. You, you contract uh, to Damascus in the Alawite heartland, or do you contract to um, the Alawite heartland, right? Both of those are highly flawed uh, situations for the regime standpoint. Uh, you know, in Damascus, the, re you know, the rebels are not fighting on the regime's doorstep. They're fighting in the regime's you know, living room right now. Okay, so what do you contract to? It's an area of active warfare. Okay, so it doesn't look very promising to contract to Damascus. And in, in the um, so-called Alawite heartland, northern Latakia is already an area of active military operations. Every day there's fighting in, in northern Latakia. So contracting to there is, is also problematic. Plus, the rebels now control lines of communication to the north out, out of Damascus. They control parts of, of Homs province, not all of it. And they control part, uh, they're gaining control of parts of Hama province. So how do you actually do it? Yeah. Very difficult. Um, Kate, the questions over priorities of SOC, uh, I think you, yeah, you put your finger on it. Um, they've been encouraged recently to form structures and to form committees, right, which is something that the Syrian National Council had a real problem doing for some, for reasons that I, I think some of you know and that I've, that, that I've outlined. So, um, so they've been encouraged to do that. I think in Marrakesh they did that. They did that in the run of the Marrakesh. Um, in terms of, now, you know, how will those committees actually function? Well, I mean, the, you know, the immediate priorities are going to be security, humanitarian assistance, and services um, in the areas that are liberated by the, uh, by the, by the free forces. Um, and I think that, that, um, that in order for, for SOC to have influence, they're going to have to get involved in those, in those things. And that's where this interesting relationship between SOC and that, the SMC, the Supreme Military Council, um, you know, it would be interesting to see how do those two entities work together. Um, oftentimes in the past, like revolutionary councils, they will have a, um, a sort of military office um, that would handle relations with the Katibas or the Lua in the area. Uh, will SOC continue this model? And there's been, out of Marrakesh, there was some talk about this and there have been subsequent meetings. So lots of questions, few answers. I wouldn't, given the pace of events, I wouldn't, I think, look, I'm not, I, I think that SOC's creation is a good thing. I think the Supreme Military Council is a good thing. I'm just, I don't think, I think it would be naive to place a lot of optimism over this working out really well quickly um, and, and for it to function well. I, I don't, I think we need to base it on the merits um, of, of, of how well they're, 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 they're operating on the ground. I don't think we see that yet. Um, you know, policy isn't always about what is. Um, it's, it, it's about what we would like things to be. And I think at the moment we would like to see this. We would really like to see this. But I think the chances of it are, 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 are less. Um, Cliff, your, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I think in a post-Assad Syria environment um, uh, with the U.S. not trying to shape the outcome, um, I think that, that the, 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 the likelihood of the Muslim Brotherhood or Salafists, um, among other groups, even extremist groups, of having influence get, uh, becomes greater. Um, and um, 
and so and that would depend on the different areas of Syria as well. There are areas of Syria that are that are more conservative, like in the north, uh, the northwest, Idlib province, um, Hama and uh, and Aleppo certainly. Um, your tribes will be, I think, uh, very influential in the east um, and in the Horan region. Um, you know, we're going to have a lot of different Syrias to deal with here. Yet another reason why to get directly involved with them. Um, we can keep the people we don't like, we can't deal with at arm's length. Okay? But the people who we can deal with, and we know who they are, we need to keep them close and, and, and to deal with them. Whether we meet with them in border areas or not, it will be, will be up to the security situation. Friends, thank you very much. Um, very glad to have you here today. And I wish you all a very happy new year. Hopefully 2013 is a more peaceful uh, new year for Middle Easterners than 2012. Thank you.